Hello, and welcome to a digital statistics lecture for Salt Lake Community College. In this video, we're going to go through the last section of Chapter 1. We're going to go through Section 1.5, the bias in sampling. This is going to be a kind of a short section. It's mostly a terminology one, but there's a few very, very important pieces here. Uh, up to this point, we've talked about the ways of gathering the sample. We've talked about random sampling. We've talked about stratified, systematic, cluster, convenience, voluntary, multi-stage. We've also talked about observational and experimental studies. We've talked about a lot of ways of gathering the sample and analyzing them. Um, however, in each of those methods that weren't random, that weren't the simple random samples, we always had some indication of bias. And we didn't really define it, but we will now. Bias is when sample results are not representative of the population. And bias can show up in a lot of different forms. The most common form of bias that you will see is what we call sampling bias. Sampling bias is bias because of the technique used to select a sample favors some individuals over others, i.e. not random. Specifically, that means not a simple random sample. Therefore, just about all sampling methods, except for simple random samples, have sampling bias. Um, examples of how it favored some individuals over others. Uh, convenience and voluntary were pretty obvious. If it's way too convenient, then that means the individual is closer to you or more likely to be selected. That's bad. Uh, voluntary, only people that are interested in the study or have a stake in the study are going to be incorporated. That's bad. Um, say stratified, where you split up the population into groups and then randomly select in each of those groups. A lot of times those groups won't be the same size. If they aren't, then that means some individuals have a higher chance of being selected than others. That's bad. Um, systematic, once you select a quote-unquote random number to start with, everybody else has a zero chance of being selected simply because they're not in the right order. So that's bad. Cluster, if, uh, once you've selected a a group of clusters to work with. That means that other people have zero chance of being selected. That's bad. Everybody needs to have the same chance of being selected at all stages of the study. That's the only way that you can remove sampling bias. Everybody has the same chance of being selected at all stages. If you ever have some individuals have a higher chance or lower chance, then there's sampling bias going on. Um, under coverage is a uh, kind of a subsection of that type of sampling bias where part of the population has a lower chance or no chance of being uh, in the sample. So that's kind of a part of sampling bias itself. Uh, the other types of bias that we talk about, though, we talk about non-response and response bias. There are a lot more than this, but these kind of cover the majority of the rest of them. Non-response bias is bias because individuals in the sample do not respond, which kind of sounds obvious, but that can be a huge problem, particularly in voluntary response studies. Most voluntary response studies have this issue. Uh, for example, you most likely have received either a questionnaire in the mail or maybe an email or even at the end of a receipt asking you to please answer this quick online survey. It'll only take a minute or two, something like that. A lot of you are probably shaking your head saying, yeah, I've gotten those. Very few people respond to those, though. Um, it usually ends up being less than like a 1% of people even respond to those optional surveys, unless there is incentive to that. If there is a significant amount of people not responding, then that could lead to non-response bias. Thirdly, response bias is the other coin. They did respond, but they responded in a problematic way. Bias because responses do not reflect the true feelings of the respondent. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that they lied, although that could be an instance of response bias. Sometimes people respond because they're afraid of, if they respond, how it's going to affect them. Um, that's sometimes called the perceived lack of anonymity, where if you don't think that your answer is going to be anonymous, that could influence how you respond to something. Um, that can be response bias. Uh, but it could also just be because you don't know. Say, maybe uh, I did an example a while ago for an observational study for cohort, um, or for case control rather, where I ask, how much money did you spend on groceries in 2016? Well, 
I don't know that answer off the top of my head, so I'm going to make an educated guess or an amount that I think sounds right, but that's about as much as I could do. So that would be an example of response bias. The answer isn't exactly correct, but that's not necessarily my fault. Uh, the list here kind of goes through some of those examples, as I uh, talked about. Um, you could have bias that comes from the interviewer. The way that they ask the question or they give off body language could elicit a different response. Um, misrepresented answers, that usually means lies. The way you word the question could also be problematic, can be either confusing or can try to elicit a very particular response. And also the ordering of questions or choices. I also kind of hinted at this before, but when you have... A, B, C, or D, and you list out like four different options for individuals, it's always good to randomize those because there's something called recency bias, which means that the first thing that people see is the one that stays in their mind the longest. So they tend to compare all the other options to that first one, and therefore because they were thinking about the first one the most, that could change their responses, particularly if they don't have a strong opinion one way or the other. So a lot of things could result in response bias. A um, few other concepts. We have types of questions. Uh, you can either have open or closed questions. If you have an open question, that means the respondent can choose their response. So they can they usually have an open space and they can put in their answer. Or closed questions, which means they choose from a list, like this A, B, C, D option. Now, on paper, open questions sound like the best because then we can get a plethora of different responses, we can get a lot of different opinions, and we can analyze them and get a lot of different ones that we maybe didn't expect to happen. Um, so open questions sound great on paper. However, in practice, they're very hard to work with. Um, because if I even ask a simple question like, what is your favorite color? Well, if I ask that question, I'm, I can get a lot of really different responses, and it can be very hard to categorize or organize all those responses. So it's very, very hard for analysis and organization purposes, depending on what the question is. Sometimes it is just better to keep it closed. All right, lastly, types of errors. And this is something that I say is incredibly important, particularly this last one. Non-sampling error is errors that result from under coverage, non-response bias, and response bias, or data entry error. Data entry error just means that the researcher messed up typing something in, which happens very often, particularly when we make lists later on in the calculator. Sampling error, however, is error that results from using a sample to estimate information about a population. That sounds kind of weird. Using a sample to estimate information about a population. That is inferential statistics. That's what we're trying to do in statistics in general, is to try to make an inference. However, the reason we call uh, something sampling error is because the sample is not the same thing as a population. The sample is not the same thing as the population. Therefore, no matter how we gather the sample, even if I gathered it using the best method possible, even if I did it using a simple random sample, that sample is not going to be perfect for the population. I'm always going to have some individuals that were not studied and therefore information is missing. Since information is missing, we call that error. So sampling error results from simply doing a sample. Any sample has sampling error. The only way, underline the only way, to get rid of sampling error is to do a census. So I'll even type that here to demonstrate that I feel this is very important. The only, whoop, the only way to eliminate sampling error from a study is by conducting a census, i.e. analyzing the entire population. Note that this is not the same thing as bias. So sampling error is not the same thing as bias. So sampling error is not the same thing as bias. 
and to eliminate sampling bias, so bias, you need to conduct a simple random sample. Those are three notes about that. that you can only eliminate error by doing a census. You can only eliminate bias by conducting a simple random sample. These are not the same thing. Bias is problems in how the sample was gathered. Error is simply that you did a sample. At all. Non-sampling error are the biases. So error that comes from not just the fact that you did a sample from other problems. So problems that arise from uh, how you did the sample, not just that you did one. So that's the difference between sampling error and sampling bias. It's a very important point, so keep that in mind. Okay, we have some examples here, and we're going to identify the different types of biases here. Now, again, we only have three different types of biases we're going to analyze. We have either sampling, we have response, and we have non-response. So these are the types of bias that we're going to look for. All right, a, re a retail store manager wants to conduct a study regarding the shopping habits of his customers. He selects the first 60 customers who enter his store on a Saturday morning. Okay, so based on that description, particularly the end there, it says the first 60 customers who enter the store, that's a pretty convenient sample. So I'll say the first, first 60 customers Sounds like a very convenient sample and may not represent the entire population uh, the, of his customers. So sampling bias slash under coverage. There's a lot of problems with this. Um, it's just the first 60 customers and they're on a Saturday morning. So for example, what if uh, customers or his customers, I guess, worked on Saturday mornings? Then they have a lower chance of being selected. Or maybe they work late and they're sleeping still at that point. Or maybe they don't need they don't typically shop on Saturdays. There's a lot of reasons of why that can incorporate sampling bias there. So the main thing here, just try to pick it apart, think about all the problems that could arise and how they selected these samples. Alright, B. A magazine is conducting a study on infidelity in marriage. The editor randomly selects four hundred married couples and asks how many times have you cheated on your spouse? Okay, well, that's a very contentious question. How many times have you cheated on your spouse? So asking that question is not likely to get uh, truthful answers. If people have cheated, they will not likely uh, admit it, particularly if they think that uh, their answers may negatively affect them. So this is response bias. They're probably going to lie. Uh, they're not likely going to answer this question truthfully um, if they did. So there's definitely an, a question of response bias here. All right, uh, C, to determine the public's opinion of the police department, the police chief obtains a sample of 15 households in his district. So that's an important point um, that they selected them from his district. And he has uniformed police officers 
go door to door and visits their homes to ask the question, how satisfied are you with the police department? Okay, there's a couple problems here. Um, I'd say, first and foremost, sampling bias. Because this is a very convenient sample. So that's one problem. That's one issue with sampling bias. Um, however, another type of bias that I would say here is definitely response bias. Having uniformed police officers go door to door and ask that question can be very intimidating. And people might not necessarily tell the truth. So it's all about thinking about how Uh, just not tell the truth, uh, how people are actually approaching this, um, how the sample was conducted. Is there an issue with how the question was asked or how the sample is gathered? A couple more. Cold Stone Creamery is considered op considering opening a new store in Murray, Utah. Before opening the store, the company would like to know the percentage of households that regularly visit ice cream shops. Uh, the researcher obtains a list of households and randomly selects 150 of them. He emails a questionnaire and asks, how often do you go out to ice cream or to get ice cream? Of the 150 questionnaires, four were returned. Okay. Um, so we don't have too much indication that there was a problem with the sample itself. It says the researcher obtained a list of households and randomly select 150 of them. So that, that sounds like a decent enough sample. I don't know how well they did the randomness, but it seems fine enough. The main problem is this end sentence. Of the 150 questionnaires, four were returned. That's a very small percentage. That's a little bit over 1% if my math is correct. Um, so that's not too great. Um, oh, uh, no, that would be a little over 2 or 3%. So it's still not too great. It's very, very low. So the amount of responses were very low. So this is an example of non-response bias. Only having four questionnaires returned of the 150 is probably not enough information for them to go on, for them to know if uh, people rarely uh, visit an ice cream shop. That's not enough responses. So. That would definitely be an example of non-response bias. Last one. Suppose you are interested in the drug habits of students. From a list of registered students, you obtain a simple random sample of 150 students and ask their teachers to administer a survey. So ask their teachers to administer a survey with how many times this week have you used illicit drugs? All right, this is like the third one with the uniformed police officers. Um, so like the police officers, the teachers asking students this question mean that they are probably more likely to lie about their usage if they use drugs. So this is an example of response bias. All right. So that's definitely an example of that. Otherwise, the sample is gathered decently fine. Simple random sample, 150 students from a list. So everything seems OK there. Um, but having the, student, the teachers ask this is very likely to cause bias in the study. All right, um, so that's those are some examples of how bias comes into play and how you do need to be careful, not just of how they were gathered, but then, so what else ha happened between the gathering of the individuals and the gathering of the data? Sometimes there's some issues there as well.
Uh, but with that said, that's everything in 1.5. It's a pretty short section. Uh, with You should be able to complete the homework for this section, so go ahead and give your hand at that before you move on into Chapter 2. Uh, but with that said, I hope you have a nice day.